Hi everyone and welcome to the next part of Aaron Nemsevich, my system. The customary quote, when you see a good move, look for a better one. From the German Grandmaster Emanuel Lasker, who was world chess champion for 27 years from 1894 to 1921. The longest reign of any officially recognized world chess champion in history. Now a review of the last part where we discussed regarding the fight against the blockader with illustrations given by Nemzovich and went through game 13 of the illustrative game section in the book. <clears throat> so now moving further into the book, Nemzovich discusses regarding king and pawn endings Frontal attack by the king against an isolated pawn as a kingly ideal. The turning movement, the role of leader, the tripartite maneuver made up of frontal attack, the enemy's forced withdrawal and the final turning movement. The reserve blockading point, the superseded opposition. Nemzovich writes, Many a stout fellow who has grown grey at chess will gasp at this. What? Is the opposition also to be abolished now? Yes, I am sorry, but this blow must fall. And first, to get our bearings, let us remark that to conceive the center arithmetically means counting the pawns standing there and regarding a numerical majority as giving a guarantee of preponderance or being greater in number. A wholly untenable conception. In reality, it is only the greater or lesser degree of mobility which can be counted decisive in passing judgment upon the position in the center. Now, if we look deep enough, we find that the opposition certainly has a relationship with the center arithmetically conceived and inner significance of both the one and the other is assessed on purely outward characteristics. In what follows, I shall give my entirely new theory which in eliminating the opposition analyzes the inner meaning of what is happening. In the position on board, the creation of a passed pawn by means of h3, f3 and g4 would not be sufficient to win, since the white king has lagged behind his passed pawn. The king must here play the role of leader, something like a pacemaker in a bicycle race and not stay comfortably at home reading the news from the racetrack. The student too must be fully alive to one point that the king in the middle game and the same king in the end game are two totally different persons. In the middle game the king is a timid soul, shuts himself up in his fortress, castled position and only when he feels himself in contact with his rook, with his own knights and bishops attentively grouped around him, does the old fellow feel himself passing well. In the end game, the king changes into a hero. Not so difficult after all, as the board is swept almost clean of enemies. And scarcely is it begun than he leaves his castle home and stalks slowly but imposingly to the center, clearly to be in the middle of things. But of this more in chapter 6. He shows however particular courage in a fight against an isolated pawn. Such a fight will be started with a frontal attack as in white king on f4 and black pawn on f5. Such a frontal position is an ideal which the king aims at 
and is one in fact well worth striving for because given the necessary material it can be attained and thus the capture of the beleaguered pawn facilitated or in a pure pawn ending it may lead to the eventual turning of the position and so if fighting forces be still available the black pawn at f5 will be exposed to multiple attacks which may lead to the protecting pieces having to take up less comfortable positions while if it comes to a plain duel between the two kings with no pieces left on the board the weapon of exhaustion zugzwang will be at the disposal of the attacker as an example in the position on board after king f3 king g7 and king f4 the ideal position king f6 and there follows bishop d3 and bishop e6 and the difference in value between the active bishop at d3 and the passive black bishop at e6 who is chained to the pawn at f5 weighs by no means lightly in the scale the pure pawn end game on the other hand would run somewhat as follows in the position on board king f3 king g7 king f4 king f6 and h4 this is the first stage of the maneuver then comes king g6 and this is the second stage the enemy king must willy-nilly go to one side a direct consequence of the zugzwang and now follows the third and last stage namely the white turning movement king e5 and white wins the frontal attack has developed into a turning movement an advantage for an enveloping movement is as we know the strongest form of attack in ascending order frontal flank and enveloping that the enveloping attack is very strong in the end game is impressed upon us by the following examples in the position on board there follows king h6 king e8 king g6 king e7 king g7 king e8 king f6 king d7 and king f7 notice the torturous manner of approach of the white king who works with zugzwang as his weapon In the position on board the continuation is king d7 king b5 and king d6 but not king d6 immediately because of king b5 and white has no good move left and is in fact himself in zugzwang in a straight jacket shall we say or finally take the position on board king g6 king e5 a6 b takes on a6 and a5 here white sacrificed a pawn in order to throw the unpleasant duty of moving on to his opponent now that we have seen the significance of the enveloping movement which by the way can only succeed against a stationary object 
which in its turn limits the movements of its own king. It will be intelligible to us why we should go to such trouble in carrying out this tripartite maneuver to bring off this form of attack. We will now consider this tripartite maneuver in its three stages in a position where there are no enemy pawns. In the position on board, the question at issue here is the win of the point d5 for the white king. Why precisely the point b5? Because the position of the king at b5 would ensure the advance of the passed pawn as far as b6. For if the king occupies this point, he has only to move to one side, say to c5, and the pawn whom we imagine as having already reached b4 will without question reach b6. In the same position, the square b6 is the first unsafeguarded stage on the pawn's road to queen. For the points b4, b5 are, are, are already secured by the king at c4. We therefore institute a frontal attack on the point b5. King b4, this is the first stage. King a6 or king c6, the forced withdrawal of the king. This is the second stage. King c5 or king a5, the third stage, the turning movement completed. And now, as he wished to do, the white king reaches b5. For instance, king b7 and king b5. In the position now reached, the white king's last move may itself be regarded as a frontal attack on the next halting place b6. The tripartite maneuver directed against b6 will run an entirely analogous or similar course, namely king a7 or king b7, king c6 or king a6, with king b6 to follow. The application of this method of thought to the defense is still simpler. In the position on board, black can draw because the white king has lagged behind. All that black has to do is to watch that the white king does not assume the role of leader. And next to keep well in mind that after the blockading point, the reserve blockading point is his safest position. With the white pawn on b4, b5 is his blockading point, b6 his reserve blockading point. In the position under consideration, Black's reply to b5 check is king b6 blockade, king b4, king b7 reserve blockade, king c5, king c7, but not king b8 or king c8 for that would allow the white king to gain ground. So king c7 b6 check, king b7 blockade, king b5, king b8 reserve blockade, king c6, king c8, b7 check, king b8 and king b6 stalemate.
to avoid any possibility of misunderstanding let us repeat that with a white pawn at b6 then b8 is the reserve blockading point for black if the white pawn is at b5 then b7 is the reserve point for black in the position on board king b8 would be a horrible move for it would leave the whole field open to the white king and give him the chance of assuming the role of leader thus king b8 and king b6 with a decisive frontal attack on the point b7 are a tripartite maneuver the theory of the opposition is in its want of clarity only be, to be described as obscurative or unclear whereas the truth is so clear the attacking king fights to get into the lead his opponent strives to prevent this with the aid of the reserve blockade point moving further nemzovic discusses regarding the privileged passed pawn a two united b the protected c the more remote the king as a whole stopper on preparations for the king's journey he writes as in life so on the chess board the goods of the world are not altogether equally divided so that there are some passed pawns who have far greater influence than other ordinary passed pawns such privileged passed pawns deserve to be highly regarded by the student who should never miss an opportunity of creating one for themselves in what follows we shall attempt to explain the effect of these privileged pawns by a consideration of their characteristics from which rules will be deduced for our direction the pros and cons in the fight with or against the stout fellows we are going to consider A the typical ideal position of two united pawns is shown on the board the relationship between them is one of the truest comradeship and therefore the position where two pawns are on the same rank must be regarded as the most natural one the strength of passed pawns so placed lies in the impossibility of blockading them for their position on h4 g4 seems to rule out any blockade on the squares h5 or g5 however the march of events will cause the two passed pawns to give up their ideal position for though they are maybe doing noble work at g4 and h4 the innate ambition towards higher things common to all past pawns will drive them forward and the moment one of them moves possibilities of blockading them will arise for instance after h5 black pieces could blockade them at g5 and h6 from this consideration coupled with the fact that these united pass pawns can have no dearer wish than to advance together to g5 and h5 there follow these rules the advance of a pass pawn from the ideal position must take place only at a moment when a strong blockade by enemy pieces is impossible of execution and further if the proper pawn has advanced at the right moment any blockade may be attempted will be weak and easily overcome the pawn's companion must then advance as soon as possible so as to recover the ideal position a 
Accordingly, at the right moment, the proper pawn, say the G pawn, will advance G5. A move which affords the enemy the chance of setting up a blockade at H5. The blockading piece, which by hypothesis was badly supported, hence the term weak blockade, will be driven off and the move H5 will bring about the ideal position once again. Very important service can here be rendered by the white king stepping into the breach which was caused by the advance of the first pawn. Thus, after say g5, knight h5, the king whom we imagine to be at hand with king g4 will slip into the breach and close it. The maneuver here described we shall call hole stopping and our king need never be afraid of being out of work. Or at worst, he can get a job as a traveling dentist and stop cavities. Alright, uh, we conclude this part of Aaron Nemzovich's My System here and uh, we shall continue onwards from the next one. Shout out to fellow streamer Distant187 aka Seth for gifting 5 subs to viewers on my Twitch channel 2 weeks ago. R. Ravi and Nicola Stoysen for continuing their subs. CL Smith 15, the top chairer with a thousand bits. Smith is a solid chess player and a fellow, a fellow streamer as well with a fine chess stream of his own. I will post a link to it in the video description. Do check him out. Rocky Mountain Chess at second with 100 bits. Thank you for the support everyone. Much appreciated. Alright, till next time. Take care and stay safe.